Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Uh, today, we're going to be in this panel. We're going to be looking at uh, talking about some of the challenges around um, accessing scholarly liter literature and some of the innovative ways that businesses and of all uh, different uh, shapes and sizes have come up with new models to address these challenges. And so we're running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to give as much time to the speakers as possible to talk about each of their different projects. Um, a brief introduction. Uh, on the panel today, we have Rob McGrath. Um, from ReadCube. We have William Gunn from Mendeley, Marguerite Avery uh, from XMIT Press, now at MIT Libraries, Jennifer Farthing uh, from JSTOR, and Eric Hellman from GluJar. So um, to get started, I'd like to invite Rob up. talk a little bit about ReCube and some of the access uh, kind of solutions that we've been thinking about over the last couple of years and some of the observations that we've had in, in doing a variety of different pilots in this space. Um, but just to give you kind of a quick overview, some of you may know ReCube from kind of the reference management desktop tool space, which is where we started, and it's kind of the, the space that's definitely closest to home in terms of addressing the needs of researchers. But in trying to do that and trying to create tools that are really great for kind of organizing your research literature and then getting discovery around other things that you should be reading based on what's already in your library, you naturally come across access boundaries. Um, and that actually became one of the biggest kind of resonating kind of feedback items we got from our user population when we were talking about how we can improve our product. And we did a lot. We tried to work with university library proxies, uh, come up with simple ways of going kind of one-click download type scenarios. But invariably, a lot of people will hit paywalls and they'll start to be frustrated. And then what happens when that occurs Do you, uh, and in serving users, as many of you are probably aware, there's a variety of different scenarios that people will, will undergo. They may try to go to Google Scholar. They may try Microsoft Academic Search and see if there's alternate download sites. Often those are pretty good at revealing uh, different repositories where content may reside. Uh, they may just do general searches for Google. They may email the author and ask for a copy. They may contact their library and ask for ILL to be, uh, to be uh, transferred over to them, which has a nice latency period that's very frustrating. Um, and so there's uh, a number of different channels, but all of that is taking them away from the focus of thought that they had at the point that they found that article and they wanted to consume it. Um, and so those were kind of the driving forces around what we wanted to do. And we started working with publishers towards that end. Um, there's a couple of different kind of things that all connect together. Uh, so ReCube is kind of a platform. Um, we do have desktop and mobile apps, uh, but we also have solutions that are tied into our publisher partnerships, and those are actually facilitating the access scenarios uh, that we're doing. So just a quick overview, ReCube is a reference manager. You've probably seen it, um, and you can import your PDFs and organize it. You can also find recommendations, uh, search for new articles, and, and so forth within the application. Um, we kind of innovated um, an uh, enhanced PDF reading experience early on, which gives you the ability to annotate. But it also gives you, which I'll show you in a moment, the ability to discover new content. And that connects to the access pathways as well. Um, sharing and metrics and information that you can kind of view around the article is also kind of a helpful part of discovery. Um, and discovery leads to access. Um, mobile, just to show you, is just kind of a mobile app that also allows you to view and consume your library and, and the same sort of interactivity of connecting. So kind of the point of the, the different platforms is that there's actually a number of different scenarios where people can kind of channel into access. Um, and as I kind of mentioned, the, uh, the enhanced PDF has the ability to click on references and go directly into the references, which very often leads into uh, access challenges. And there are some platforms that actually have interlinking partnerships between different publishers through reference linking. And that's actually a very interesting way of brokering access and something that we're, we're looking at very closely in terms of how we can broker relationships to allow kind of that serendipitous discovery layer to be facilitated, especially when the end-to-end -end recipients don't have access. Um, sorry, a couple of extra screenshots about kind of how people access and engage with content. So, Checkout was the first kind of access solution that we implemented. And uh, uh, we launched a couple of versions of it about two years ago, starting with the Nature Publishing Group. Um, and what that enabled was at the point of hitting a paywall, uh, we tried to introduce new price points. Um, and what we came up with were 48-hour rentals or cloud access um, or the traditional PDF access. Um, and so wh why is this interesting? Um, first off, the, the traditional PDF price point is, is fairly high. 
Um, most uh, academic researchers that you would talk to would never personally pay for a $35, sometimes 50 or more dollar price point. Um, a lot of commercial institutions, that's a different story. If you have a third party payer at the end of the day, the price sensitivity is, is far less pronounced. Um, and so what we were trying to do is just kind of discover, okay, if there, if there were some lower price uh, options in, in the uh, market, would academic researchers actually consume this? How valuable, in a, in a sense, is this particular article to their, their research? And it turns out that uh, when we introduced these price points, um, overwhelmingly, uh, researchers were consuming the, uh, the rental, the, the cheap price point, the price point that's uh, an expensive cup of coffee. Um, the institutional buyers were actually staying with the, the $35 price point, um, and uh, that gives you a PDF that is technically un unrestricted. The, uh, the, the rental and other formats were, uh, were, were restricted formats. And cloud allows you to view it within the ReadCube platform. You can go and check out. We introduced a second version of that for libraries, and that is called ReadCube Access. And in that scenario, when the patron comes to the, the paywall page, they can see that they have access through their library. And in this case, it's very much the same as uh, the checkout scenario that I showed you a moment ago, except for it's borne by the library. The, the price is paid out of a, a, a deposit um, account that the library sets up with, with ReadCube in this case. So um, those are some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, we're, we're trying to innovate in different ways through a number of different channels to promote both the discovery and the uh, introduction of the, the sharing scenario once they discover it. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. So I'm going to tell you about Ungluit, um, and how we're building distribution and sustenance mechanisms for free ebooks. Uh, one way, how do I let's try that? Does that work? Yes. So one way to think of what we're doing is is to to to, to say that we're trying to build a bookstore for free ebooks, for books that want to be free. You might ask yourself, well, why do we need this? Um, well, it turns out that book publishing has an extremely well-developed supply chain. All of these players in the supply chain, their mission is to somehow help the people who create books to connect with the people who consume books, readers and, and authors. Uh, now, if you look at the, 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 the names inside those boxes, a lot of those uh, players uh, survive on taking a percentage of the purchase price of the book. Uh, even libraries hate free ebooks. Uh, so uh, the whole supply chain breaks when the ebook is free because there's no percentage to, to uh, provide an engine for, for all of these things to work. Uh, so I thought the best way to, to describe what we are actually doing is just to talk about the books. So this is a book called Oral Literature in Africa. It's a relatively old book. Um, it's sort of the life work of uh, an aging academic named Ruth Finnegan. And um, this book basically put oral literature on the scholarly map. It created a whole field. But the problem was that, that scholars in Africa really didn't have access to the book because it was too expensive. Uh, so we worked with the publisher ran a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, we raised about $7,000 uh, to turn this into a free ebook. So how do you get textbooks, free textbooks, into classrooms? Uh, this is a book, uh, a textbook on high performance scientific compu computing. It was funded by the Sailor Foundation. Uh, but how are teachers supposed to you know, know what books they can use in their classrooms. Uh, this is a cookbook um, by Leanne Brown. It is a great cookbook. <laughs> but uh, the reason she wrote this book uh, was focused on people who have to survive on $4 a day on, on uh, food stamps. And uh, so the question was, how, how do you make this book, how do you get this book it to the people who actually uh, it was meant, meant to. How do you get libraries uh, to, to list this in their catalogs? Um, so we're making uh, a mark records so that it's easy for libraries to, to load this book into their catalogs and, and get it to people who can use it. 
this is this is a wonderful novel called zero sum game written by lisa wong who was a, a math major at mit it's uh, she didn't want uh, to, to, to uh, extort money from people who wanted to read her books. Uh, so she put a Creative Commons license on it and made it free, but have any of you guys read it? It's a fantastic book, and when, when 100,000 people have read it and they make a major motion picture of it, you'll be able to see, say you read it because you got it from Ungluit. And you can give her money if you want, using the buttons on our website. Uh, what about books that are derivative works of Creative Commons licensed ebooks? We've just started working with a French publisher called Frame a Book. Uh, that their mission is to take books that are uh, Creative Commons licensed, translate them into French, and make them available. Uh, so we are helping them uh, finance their operation by letting people contribute to this effort. Um, what about fair use works? Uh, this is a book that was uh, produced last week. It's a, a remix of uh, a book uh, produced by Mattel, <clears throat> where uh, uh, Casey Feastler uh, uh, took out all the, 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 the horrible, cringe-inducing, sexist text about how uh, Barbie needed uh, help from guys to make her uh, a computer game work um, and made a really great book. Now, how, how this is legal to distribute under uh, fair use doctrine in the US, so how do you go about making it available? Well, we're uh, listing it in our catalog. Uh, we have about uh, uh, over a thousand uh, Creative Commons licensed books in our catalog. Uh, we're also making a, an OPDS feed. This is a, uh, a, a type of Atom feed that um, it's used in uh, iPhone and iPad and Android apps uh, to present uh, books on, on in, inside apps. Uh, so we basically have three revenue programs uh, that are designed to replace that percentage uh, that the conventional book supply chain uses. Uh, the Thanks for Ungluing program uh, uh, is meant for books that are already free licensed. Uh, we have a pay what you want system and so that people can support uh, the books that they like. Uh, the Buy to Unglue program is uh, where the uh, creator or the publisher or the author uh, set a revenue goal and when they hit the revenue goal, the book becomes free. And finally, we have the Pledge to Unglue program, which is uh, a, a, a crowdfunding uh, a program similar to Kickstarter. And so the book becomes free if they reach their uh, funding target. Uh, so that's a quick overview of what we're doing. We can't do it alone. Check out Unglue at unglue.it. Hi, so um, my, um, I'm Margie Avery. I was with the MIT Press for about 10 years, and I just uh, stepped into the MIT libraries uh, to uh, continue scholarly communication research. Uh, but the initial topic I wanted to talk about was uh, trying to create alt metrics for open access scholarly monographs uh, to determine value for university presses um, with something aside from uh, dollars earned, uh, but that became really unwieldy for seven minutes. So I'm gonna talk about other issues of access for a minute. So, uh, so the traditional barriers for access that we have are usually we think of price, uh, time, um, time for the access to the research, um, how long does it take you to get it, when is it available for you to look at, um, and format, um, what kind of, how, how are you accessing this material? Um, so I want to put this into context about university presses, just briefly, um, since a lot of what we're talking about is not about university presses, so I feel the need to uh, explain what they are. Um, but there's over 100 of them. Uh, they are mission-driven nonprofit organizations. Uh, they serve the public good by generating and disseminating knowledge. Uh, 
they are charged with publishing works of scholarly, intellectual, or creative merit for more specialized audiences, which also means a smaller audience than is and we're not going to sell as many books. Um, UPs are extensions of their sponsoring institutions and tend to reflect the research that's done at these institutions, but that's not always the case. Um, and they are considered a keynote in knowledge in the research network of various scholarly uh, communities. So just to talk for a second about, we've talked a lot about open access and I'm sure you're all familiar with this, so I'm not gonna talk about it very much, but these are just the, the uh, current, uh, on the vanguard of university presses and scholarly monographs and open access. So there's um, a new open access advocacy group called Authors Alliance, which is trying to create a agreement for authors to um, work into their contracts, making their content openly available after price, after sales drop off after a certain period of time. And Pam Samuelson from Berkeley is doing this. Um, some of their open access publishing initiatives that have cropped up in the last two years are Knowledge Unlatched, which is um, a UK initiative from Francis Pinter, which is kind of uh, similar to, um, reminds me a little bit about of Unglued in terms of the crowdfunding aspect of it, is if a certain number of libraries purchase the book, then it will be openly available for, for all libraries and everyone to read. Um, there's an Open Library for the Humanities Initiative, and again, these are all dealing with monographs, which is not what we've been thinking about a lot here. Um, Amherst College Press has started a new digital press, uh, an open access press that um, is in the conceptual stage right now. and. There's a group of 70 libraries uh, called the, uh, forming under the Oberlin Group, which are hoping to create their own platform for open access digital publications. Um, time is our other is one of our other barriers that we're looking at. So, uh, and we've talked a lot of people here have talked about different uh, communicating communicating research at different stages, and uh, this is a rough life cycle of research that would then end up in a book. So you might tweet an initial research result. You could end up with a draft paper on SSRN. This could be discussed at a conference paper, turn into a journal article, and then eventually be a published book. This, this life cycle here, even though these, uh, you know, this tends to be a longer life cycle. This is an example of a book that I published about the Panama Canal and the environmental impact of this. And I did take liberties with my author saying that he tweeted OMG, a ship passing through the Panama Canal uses 52 million gallons of water. But that is true. He didn't actually tweet that. But uh, that this is showing this is actually the life cycle of his work. But so that's a longer four-year life cycle um, to publication. So format is the big thing that I'm going to talk about for 57 more seconds. Um, so what does content want to be? Um, the architect Louis Kahn asked famously, what does a brick want to be? And that would determine what, what a building should be. And format is really the thing I've been thinking about with publishing. With all the books that I have signed and all the authors that I've worked with, uh, more and more research I really was not able to be able to publish in the book or uh, in a journal form, in a journal. So I really wanted to move beyond the book and journal binary and to create digital, authoritative digital publications, which is what I'm hoping to do in the library now. So some new things that university presses are doing is to engage with shorter formats. So this is actually engaging with the question of time and with format. So these are short, um, short projects in length and the time to market is also brief as well. So um, we have my former press, MIT Press, which is using existing content and creating these into smaller bite-sized pieces called bits. Um, presses like Stanford and Rutgers and a host of others are commissioning new content that they're getting to market in about three months. And then Minnesota is actually taking the most progressive stance, I think, by actually publishing developing content that they will then hope to create into a book later, sort of along the model of, of SSRN of posting something in a not finished format. Uh, and this is, that's Forerunners, which is what Minnesota is doing. So one example of this, um, of, of a publisher that's actually a university press publisher that's removed all these barriers already um, in, one pro in one experimental publication is Cambridge University Press. Uh, with the History Manifesto. So this was just published, this is um, by two historians, which as we all know are on the vanguard of scholarly research and publishing technology, British historians especially. Uh, but this is a book called The History Manifesto where they uh, got this to from start to finish in about four months. So this is, the, uh, the irony of this is this book is about actually long durée history and that we wanna be looking at long timescales 
rather than short increments, but they were able to produce it in a short increment. Uh, so this book is available open access. It actually had a very low price point and it came out very quickly. So this is a, an example of what is possible. But, uh, and this is the author page, this is the page that Cambridge put up when they released this book, Open Access, simultaneously. And actually what, um, some sales information that I probably shouldn't disclose, but it's not my book. Uh, but they've actually sold the, um, sold the same number of copies of books as they've had free downloads, which has been, in six weeks, um, over 2,000 copies, which is great for a history book from University Press. So that's just a snapshot of what's happening in the University Press book monograph publishing world. Thanks. All right, well, thanks very much, Alex and um, Amy and uh, the Alex and everyone for um, and Microsoft for hosting us here. Um, I'm going to talk about something that I just kind of grandiosely called uh, next gen content discovery. Um, just uh, so here I am. I'm Mr. Gunn, and if you're a computer, here I am. Um, we talked about Orchid before. Um, I always tell people that you know, you can come and chat with me later if you really want to know what my presentation is about, and tell me you were busy signing up for an orchid. No, that's totally fine. I'll, I'll forgive you. Um, okay, so um, you know, uh, statement one: um, search doesn't work. Around 2009, there was a venture capitalist guy by the name of Paul Kudrowski who was looking for a dishwasher, and so he went, you know, uh, onto Google and he typed in you know, dishwasher reviews. And he, you know, Googled and he searched and he kept Googling and searching around. And eventually he uh, came to the realization that the entirety of the Google search results for dishwasher reviews was all spam. It was all generated crap. There was actually nothing useful in, in Google for, you know, about buying dishwashers. It was all content farm stuff and, and spam. Um, this guy uh, wrote up his story a little bit and assigned his students a, a task to go and you know, connect with other people in their class on LinkedIn. And if you can't find out, if someone's not on LinkedIn, search for them on Google. And of course, that entirely failed for, for these people as well. This guy, Joe Atwood from uh, Stack Exchange, many of you guys know, um, did the same thing. He was looking for an iPhone 4 case. This is back in 2001. Um, he you know, Googled around a little bit found the whole process entirely futile, and he just went to Amazon and looked it up there, which is pretty much what I do now. Um, and so a lot's been written about content farms and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, aha, but you're saying that this is not the scholarly domain. We don't have these problems in, in search. Well, um, maybe that's true. Maybe, um, you know, as the recent paper from the Google Scholar team says that actually, Search in Google Scholar works reasonably well. It's reinvigorating old content, um, and this works across disciplines, um, and so on and so forth. Perhaps, you know, um, that's true. You can find a lot more old stuff in Google. You can also find this in Google Scholar. Um, and this is actually in the Google Scholar Index because it matches all the criteria Google looks for. It looks like a paper. You know, it's got a title, it's got authors, it's got affiliation, abstract. This is indexed in Google Scholar. Um, aha. But Google Scholar is not a curated database. Maybe PubMed. Well, OK, 6,000 papers in PubMed every day. Um, lots of people trying to solve the problem of finding these things. Probably all of these people wouldn't feel this is an interesting enough problem to go out and solve and raise money for. Were PubMed solving everyone's search problems, even for their own domain? So curate, you know, this is not a human scale problem if you're talking about 6,000 papers. Uh, even in this one little domain, although it's a big domain. So, so what do you do? Um, one of the things that we're starting to do is uh, looking at push rather than pull. Uh, so where you can think of a search as you're going out there and actively trying to find something and, and you know, get the search engine to retrieve it and bring it to you. The other idea is, you know, well, let's learn from someone's behaviors and you know, activities over time and push things at them. So we have a couple of different ways that we can push out recommendations um, in the desktop client. The desktop client is a reference manager, kind of like EndNote, um, with some neat collaborative features. But this isn't the sales pitch, so I won't go in too much into it. We also have related papers on the page and uh, related researchers. Um, and our initial tests on some emails with these recommendations show that, I don't know if you guys know 
anything about you know email marketing, but this is actually you know many fold better than usually you get. So there's evidence that researchers really like the recommendation way of putting something in front of someone before maybe they even really knew what they were, were looking for. And so there's a lot of different ways you can do this, pulling in the different um, information, use collaborative filtering, use popularity, behavior analysis, um, as well as the actual content in the article itself to pull things out. Um, so that is my, that is my statement. Cer is search broken or is it not? Um, I would, I would um, suggest that it's not entirely broken. There's a lot of room for improvement yet. Um, and let me just show you one little thing over here that we are doing to try to fix it a little bit. So this is a uh, search for the Mendeley catalog. And so let's just start typing in a keyword. Oh, look, suggestion of keyword um, uh, terms. All right, so let's go. Let's search that. Now it's given me a whole bunch of results, 350,000. That's useless. Um, Let's just pick the ones from 2011. Pick that, filters it down, um, and then you pick your authors. So already a vast improvement over the type in a keyword, get a whole bunch of results back. You have no idea what to do with them or how to filter it down in a useful way or what the search operator is supposed to use for this particular syntax or anything. So search may be broken, but there's a lot of things we can do. Um, uh, pushing things to people and just making search better. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jen Farthing from JSTOR, and I want to tell you a little bit about our program Register and Read and how our program's doing two years in and possibly a short demo. Let's have, see how we do with time. Um, JSTOR's mission, expanding global access, understanding the needs of our users so we can deliver more value to them helping our publishers who share those interests accomplish those, th those same goals. So JSTOR and its users, you probably know JSTOR from the library, but I'm going to talk about something that is a little outside of the institutional access model. Um, we have 150 million content accesses per year, and I put a couple question marks there because you might think, what's that? Uh, content accesses are every time that an individual user goes and interacts with the content. They might download it, they might read it, they might save a citation. Currently, we're serving more than 9,000 institutions worldwide. Um, we have more than 2,000 archival journals in JSTOR. And some people don't know this, we have more than 27,000 books. We're not going to be talking about books today because the Register and Read program right now only has journals in it. We are um, working with um, more than 1,100 publishers, and we work in licensing arrangements with them. They're from around the world. So we had all these institutional users, but then other users wanted in. They're like, you know, why do I have to be in a library to get that content? So over the past 10 years, JSTOR has added programs to help independent researchers and unaffiliated scholars get at that content they need. So our first program was early journal content, making content in the public domain open to users. Next, we have our publisher sales service, which has a really interesting name. Um, but that's where our publisher partners set the price for their articles that they put on sale through the JSTOR platform. They set the price, we offer it to users and hopefully I'll get to show that. We have an alumni access program where libraries by, um, by choice have decided whether they would like to extend their access to their alumni groups. There's more than 100 of them right now. And then Register and Read, which is our guest access program. Um, finally, just last year, we launched JPASS, which is our new member access plan for individuals. So let's see, Register and Read. So free, limited access for everybody. Um, this was an experiment that we launched in March of 2012. And I say we, but I was not yet at JSTOR. Um, we piloted with 76 journals from a select group of publisher partners. Uh, found mainly through search referrals, users land on an article view page. And without institutional access, they're shown the option to buy the article or read it for free. So JSTOR now allows up to three free reads over a two-week period. So if users stay on top of adding and subtracting articles on their free reading shelf at JSTOR, they can read up to 78 articles for, uh, per year for free. 
So this little chart shows um, the past couple of years. Following our pilot phase, we added about 1,000 journals to the program. And by the end of 2013, we had 1,300 journals in the program and got our 1 millionth user. Over the past year, that figure has grown to 2 million users, which we got just about last week. And there's more than 1,600 journals in the program now. And that's all through publisher participation. They opt in to put their journals in the register and read collection. Of these 2 million users, more than a third of them are repeat users. And now comes some data for you. Um, I'm not sure if you can read all the labels, but um, so we want to know who are these people. The chart on the left breaks out the users by their self-reported classification. So for some, register and read is their only access option, but for others, it supplements the partial access provided by their institutions. Not all institutions participate in all the JSTOR programs. Um, you'll notice that the largest components are undergrad and grad students. That's in the red and the kind of gold tone on the left. Um, and they're not our target audience, which is independent researchers and unaffiliated scholars. We also have thousands and thousands of those. Um, but take a look at the chart on the right. This is our top countries list. The US is in red and by far the largest, followed by UK, India, Canada, then Germany. But the light blue wedge is huge, and that's everywhere else. Many of these users are in regions with no institutional access to JSTOR, and many of the students that we see over on the left in the red and gold are some of the people that are in that light blue area, and they're making, they're making that up. So some of our publishers often ask us, well, hey, I see a lot of undergraduate users in there. I thought you were targeting independent users. So two ways, they, their school may not have the, the journals that they need, so they're supplementing, or they might not be from US, UK, and some places that have a lot of access options. Um, now this chart shows interest and access. Um, this is the variety of the content that our users access. It's the top 10 categories, mostly arts, um, history, stuff like that. Um, our 2 million users have checked out more than 3.5 million articles in just two and a half years. And here's where the insight part comes in. Both JSTOR and its publisher partners are interested in this information. From the previous slide, we learned where new years, users live and what kinds of learners are interested in the content on JSTOR. But from this view, we can add the content access information. We make reporting available to publishers that details article access by journal and shows the user demographics. So they like that. Um, just super quick, um, if you're at, let's say, Google Scholar and you search on something, you might find this article at the top and see that it comes from JSTOR. Um, you click through it and it gives you an opportunity. You could buy it. Publisher sets the price for this one at 10 bucks, or you can read it online. Um, and it's got a little banner, so I'll check on that. And it expands and gives you a little bit more about the program because it's got a couple of rules. And then to get into it, you have to register. That's how we get the data. So this is the registration form that we share with all my JSTOR users, whether you're in an institutional or not. And then it asks you, are you sure you want to add that to your shelf? So this is my first time adding. And you can see I have three spaces. And I say, yeah, why not? Let's add that to the shelf. Um, so I have two more spaces. And now I've surfaced an ad. And this is for the JPASS program that I mentioned, which is um, a membership that you can get for a month or a year. You can pay for it. So we take the opportunity to upsell them here if they want to do things like download the content that they can't do with the Register and Read program. And then I go in to read the article, and that's it. So um, I'd like to open up the panel to the audience, but I'd like to ask one question before um, we go. Um, knowing what you know about your different projects, each of you have been working in this space um, for quite a while. Um, uh, for all your different projects, knowing what you know now, would there be anything you would have changed in your path or decisions that you, um, you would have maybe chosen the other door as opposed to the one you went through? Regrets. <laughs> <laughs> so the, 
probably the, the biggest thing is that um, I think we've learned that user interface has a huge part to do with how people engage with any of the systems. We've been fortunate to do a number of pilots with different publishers and, and experimenting in this space a fair bit. Um, and being able to, uh, to iterate quickly to, to track very carefully um, how kind of the usage and engagement um, is occurring on the platforms is, is really critical. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, there's nothing worse than finding out a few weeks later that I wish we had tracked that um, and then having to do and wait a little bit longer to do that. So I'd say that kind of um, that's one small lesson to, to learn is just to iterate and track from the very beginning as much as you can. You'll never get it all right, but, but getting as much as you can right uh, is, is very helpful. I would, um, my only regret is I, I would try to have pushed for, um, for metrics to create, to determine value outside of um, sales for publications as I think uh, with research publications, the circulation of the research and uh, the circulation of the scholarship is what's really important to scholars and uh, the sales are obviously important to the business end of the presses, but that's not, that does, that's not the entire picture. So to try to articulate that value and express that to the university. I regret nothing. No. Um, I think if I was, if I was going to uh, go back to the beginning and figure out, okay, what is something that's going to be really, really important um, that we didn't jump on as, as good as we could, I think we would have really focused on the social aspects of the, pla of the platform. Um, a bit more our, our social features even today with our, our groups online and um, at sharing you know references and papers um, are really still kind of at like the the bare minimum viable product stage and they're not um, really front and center as, um, as I think they could be so um, I think for J for JSTOR with register and read we um, hope that you happen upon the article through a search and then you get referred into the landing page for the article and if you don't have access in your institution you may be offered the opportunity to read it we don't have the ability to sort and search when you're on the jstor platform only that content that might be available to you through the program so it's on our wish list it's something that we'd like to have but we were anxious to get something out there so um, again, it is in beta. It's a minimum viable product. It would be great to have that in the future, and we will have that. Uh, so Unglue started out as a crowdfunding platform for free books. Uh, what we didn't really understand was how broken the book supply chain is when the books are free, how ineffective it is to just sort of put a book on a website and expect people to be able to use it. Um, so if we were to do everything over again, we'd start uh, with uh, what we're calling uh, Thanks for Ungluing, which is gather all the Creative Commons licensed free ebooks that we can get and, and, and uh, fix the supply chain problems first. Hi, um, so I'm a research and instruction librarian and I work really closely with students and I know sort of the population that's been talked about has been um, a different type of publisher uh, or researchers, probably more at the faculty or lab uh, end. Uh, but what I've noticed is that students are publishing materials and they are sort of using some of these tools that are up there that you, that you all are talking about. Um, but the biggest frustration is sort of the integration of that. And um, one of the other audience members asked a little bit about that uh, for the first group. And so they'll use a product like Mendeley for about two minutes. It's too hard to set up, or they don't want to do it. And it's hard to integrate with the other tools. It doesn't work with Google Docs, but ProQuest works with Google Docs and, and all these different things. And, and when I work with the students, the biggest thing is that um, to teach them about the research process and sort of just the ethical use of information. And I think that, I don't know if any of you can sort of speak to a really beginner part of this research process and how your tools can integrate with that. There's, there is one comment that I can make um, with regards to interoperability with other tools. 
And um, that's the importance of, of good, you know, very um, performance and um, an open, well-documented APIs. Um, so we have one at, at Mendeley, um, as Zotero now has an API, uh, ProQuest and InNote, you know, still uh, not so much. So we'd love more interoperability, but that's something that everyone has to really participate in. So the book industry has designed out interoperability. Amazon has designed Kindle so you can't take your Kindle books off of your Kindle. Same with Apple iBooks. Uh, the whole process of using DRM, digital rights management, on, on eBooks is designed to present, prevent people from doing stuff with eBooks. And so that has been a big barrier for uh, adoption of eBooks in general for, for many types of uses. I'll just speak to the, the formats uh, thing. Uh, DRM is part of it, but in, the, in kind of the space of kind of Recube and we think about it, it's usually journal articles, um, typically PDFs. Um, and so a lot of the uh, kind of early problems that we saw in terms of building workflows was first actually how do we identify the PDF? And so that when you take this otherwise kind of disconnected form that may or may not have a DOI even associated with it, how do you then kind of incorporate that into your library and make it searchable and reduce the level of effort involved in, in getting up to speed? Um, but I, I mentioned the PDF because it is kind of this, this kind of anchor point. It can go from program to program. It can be emailed. It can be used in, in many different ways. Um, and in that sense, because it is inherently portable, it's, it's very useful. It's also very limiting because it's very static um, and it's difficult to connect online with revisions and updates and all the kind of additional information that comes out around, around literature. Um, so I, I, I agree APIs, but also kind of just the portability of, of the different formats that people are going to do. Um, uh, not every user is going to need a reference manager. If you're only dealing with a couple of articles a month or, or so, you may not actually have a compelling need for advanced research management software. But for those that do, typically you'll have hundreds or thousands of PDFs and, and other related research forms that you need to organize and being able to take those from one app to the other, whether you're doing kind of active discovery versus active paper writing are very different tasks and, and different apps may be better for different um, types of workflows. Um, and so as long as they can work together, it can go towards kind of a solution. I, I actually would challenge the, the notion, because there are students, mm -hmm. j just for your own audience, you know, product um, development, there are students who, they may only have five or six articles, mm -hmm. um, but they need to be able to translate between disciplines and becoming aware of like how to integrate some of those articles more seamlessly from different formatting and not get caught up on the formatting. Um, so we do have students that use ReadCube, that use Mendeley, that use all of these products um, well, um, even with four or five articles in their library. So just for your own awareness, students are using them that way. Oh, yeah, certainly. Um, I think sometimes when we think of our user demographic, we, we have kind of uh, the kind of super researchers that tend to have these very massive libraries um, that they spend a lot of time kind of organizing. And then you have kind of maybe the, uh, the more undergraduate level engagement that you have like a bunch of things you work with, with a course pack or something of those sorts, sometimes getting in. But you're absolutely right, uh, there, there's a, a use case. But just for what it's worth, when we talk to most users, um, the, they're not switching from other apps. Most of the time they're coming from Windows Explorer or Finder, like that is kind of the, the starting point that they're used to. And when you actually engage with dialogue, desktop operating search is actually probably the, the biggest kind of um, kind of crutch that you can use if you don't use a reference manager. I've got a question for you, Rob, and, and others to chime in if, if you think it's relevant. But specifically on the uh, $6 pay for a 48-hour mm -hmm. access, how have the dialogues gone with the publishers when you've gone out beyond the, the Macmillan family and have that? Because I know that there are concerns about what the, what the overall revenue difference is. So there's a couple of dimensions to that. Um, first off, uh, there's, there's a question of what that's going to do to the PDF sales or the traditional sales. Like if you're introducing new uh, formats and mediums, uh, does that mean that you're going to be kind of generating incremental sales with those new mediums or are they going to cannibalize the legacy existing ones? Um, and we've been 
it was an open question. We, we did a number of pilots. We've done it with NPG and Wiley and a number of other uh, publishers now. And, and uh, the, the data that we've collected is that it tends to actually not cannibalize the PDF. There's a contingent, a contingent uh, group of people that are not particularly price sensitive and will choose that format option. And then there's a huge group of people that are very price sensitive that will buy the rental option. So in all of our pilots that we've done so far, we have not seen any decline in the PDF sales. And rather, we see a nice lift in the lower price points. Um, similarly, the other part of the equation is, is this going to affect site licenses and other parts of the business? Um, and uh, the, the difference really is that you can't compare them. The, the cost per download or CPD rates that you would look at in a site license are not really the same as a 48-hour rental. Um, I mean, it's a different format. So even if the price point of the 48-hour rental were lower than the CPD rate, it isn't the type of kind of um, format that would compel a library to decline the site license. The site license is still, in, in almost every case, going to be the most cost-effective way to acquire the content. Um, and libraries often, I mean, that is the, the purpose of, of electronic librarians, is to provide that access. Any other questions? I think one of the um, difficulties I have with any sort of pay model on content is, is not the lack of willingness to pay. It's that you have no way of appraising the value of what you're going to buy until you've read it. Um, so you could be spending 30 bucks on a total piece of garbage, or it could be the best article you've ever written, written or read, sorry, and it's just a total guess. And so that ends up being the barrier. And um, so um, rentals, whatever it is, it, it's um, it's very similar to software. You don't know if software is helpful to you until you try it. So um, it seems like the models haven't quite. Well, some of the models, like the the free online, but then buy the PDF, seem to get at that. But not all the pay models that I've seen seem to recognize that's the real barrier to a lot of people. It's it's a great thing. We got a lot of feedback about that early on. Um, I can't say that we've solved it, but some of the steps that we have taken to kind of mitigate that risk is uh, in all the publishers that we're working with, they've agreed to do first page previews. Uh, many of them allow you to view all the figures, the, the captions associated with them, uh, the references, um, and a blurred out version of all the subsequent pages, which gives you a sense of the structure, the length of the paper. In many cases, you have no idea if the $32 paper you're buying is two pages long or 50. Um, like it's, it's not actually presented at the point of sale in most cases. So, um, we've tried to do that, um, and I think it, it has helped quite a bit in terms of the uh, kind of the comfort level. So if you try it in ReadKeep, you can you can actually see the first page. All the subsequent ones are blurred out. On the left, you have the checkout options, and and that's kind of the the option that you can choose if if you think it's it's worth that risk. But it is a risk <laughs> with any of it. Um, if the price point gets down to the sort of we think the cup of coffee. Uh, level, then it's a relatively small one, and depending on the researcher and, and how relevant they think it is, sometimes you just don't want to hunt for a substitute good, and it's taking your own time to do that too. Um, you don't actually factor in the, the amount of time that people will spend hunting for content online, asking their librarian to provide it through ILL or some other latency kind of uh, laden format. Um, so um, for some people, it just makes sense if you want instantaneous delivery. Let's do one more question in the back there. Um. So what would your advice be for large licensing publishers that are much more ingrained in the pre-open access era? What would what would suggestions do you have for both maintaining them getting revenue, but also innovating and adjusting to all these new exciting things? I'll, I'll go, but I'll try not to hog it. Um, it's, it's a question that we talk a lot about with our publishers, um, and there's all sorts of innovative things. Um, I mean, off the top of my head, everything from kind of the e-commerce sort of rental and other formats to ad-supported sponsorships, um, different ways of kind of delivering kind of access to, to users um, in, in clever ways using technology. And one of the, the ways that we're trying to do it right now is, is to find ways that don't overtly threaten the existing business models. Um, and that means the site license and others that it's, you can't do anything overly radical in this space. And we wouldn't want to overnight either. But there's a lot of room, I think, through technology, through apps and ecosystems, uh, just as has been done in the music and, and media and movies. 
um, to explore different ways of, of brokering access, uh, of looking at different potential payers in the equation uh, across the board from sponsorship from vendors to uh, end users who could be researchers to libraries and different budget scenarios that haven't been done before. So I think there's actually incredible room for creativity. Um, uh, doing pilots quickly, uh, they're not all going to work necessarily, but, but if you can mitigate the risk and, and kind of quantify what you're getting into, uh, most of the time it's actually not nearly as large as you think um, in terms of what the worst case scenario could possibly be. Um, and uh, better armed with data will just allow kind of that evolution of, of the different models, open access and otherwise, to kind of, kind of coalesce together, I think, in, in the most productive way. For me, it really comes down to um, what what Jeff said earlier about making sure your revenue model is in line with your your mission. Uh, you know, whether you're a far profit company or not, it it makes a lot of sense to think about this. And if you have content and you want that content to be distributed, um, then you have services on top of a free content layer. It's the kind of one of the more obvious things. The whole open source business model is. You know, well, you can't charge for the access to the code anymore, so you have all your services around it and your support and your hosting and so on and so forth, right? That's kind of the basic way that, that people generally go in, in that respect. And that's certainly what we at, at Mendeley, being a, you know, a value-added service owned by a traditional you know, content-based publisher, is hoping that we can uh, make come true. I think another way to think of it is to distinguish between the container and the content. So if the content is open and the content is available, but the container is what you paid for and that is the convenience factor with how you're consuming it, such as the book is a container of content, um, an Amazon a Kindle file is um, a Apple, I don't know what Apple's format is called. It doesn't have a clever name. Uh, but these are those are um, formats that, that readers will pay for to use for what will be useful for them. But if then the content is open and searchable, then that allows it to circulate and uh, ostensibly is best for both worlds. Yeah, the problem with a lot of the, the pay-per-view uh, things is that it, it, it gets in the way to some extent of... Um, some of the uses, some of the more valuable uses that you might make. So for example, human reading of a PDF is a valuable use, but you know, um, mining across you know, thousands of, of articles is an emerging area of, of reuse that may have a, quite a large potential, and so we need new business models that get kind of behind the you know, one article, one, one charge kind of um, point of view. With JSTOR, what we've done with our programs is we have the free guest access, then we have, you can you can buy one if you want to. And to Tim's point, you can read it freely, and then if you still want to buy it, you can do that. And we offer our publishers information on that, as well as uh, the royalty. And then talking to publishers, they were really nervous about letting that content out for free for reading, even in limited ways that we're doing. And it hasn't proven to be an issue. The single article sales have, have not gone down. When we launched our uh, member model, JPass, we also got some feedback from publishers that they were nervous. What's that going to do with our article sales? They're just different users. And when we've allowed them to read it for free before purchasing one or before joining the membership, they, they've done that. And they're doing that in numbers. So that's what we have today. But so far, the publishers have been very satisfied with it. I think the most important thing for uh, the, the traditional publishing organizations to do is to cut their cost basis. Uh, they they uh, have you know offices in very expensive real estate. They're very fancy. They they, they pay a lot of people uh, to do a lot of expensive things, and they need to start thinking about how they can cut the cost of what they do. On, on that note, we will, uh, we'll break for, we'll break for um, lunch. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Mm -hmm.